I'd like to talk, I mean, uh, to mix together uh, some of the things I like best with some things that I'm very much not an expert in. And uh, um, so this talk has sort of a speculative nature. Um, but I'll start off by talking about uh, the regular solids or platonic solids, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with. They are um, some very simple and beautiful geometric structures. Uh, the simplest one is the tetrahedron. So it's uh, a pyramid with a triangular base and three triangular sides and they're all equilateral. So it's, uh, it has a lot of symmetries. I, we can rotate it uh, by an angle of 120 degrees around any one of its vertices. So you can uh, move any side to any side, any edge to any edge, any corner to any corner. And um, so this will be a continuing theme. All, all the platonic solids are very symmetrical. And um, I'm interested in particular the symmetries of things. And uh, an important aspect of symmetry is that if you, uh, so I consider symmetry an operation, like the, the symmetry is the rotating by 120 degrees. And if you perform two of those operations in succession, it's still a symmetry. So, um, and also if you undo one of those operations, it's still a symmetry. So the symmetries of some system or object have the property uh, of being cl what's called closed under multiplication and, or under inversion. And a system like that is called a group. So I'll be talking about groups quite a bit. Okay, so the simplest one is this tetrahedron and it has four faces. And then the next one is the cube which is well enough known. Uh, technically, it would be the hexahedron, the six-sided figure, but it's so well known, we just call it the cube. And then the, there's an eight-sided one with eight triangular faces, octahedron, and a 12-sided one with 12 pentagonal faces. Each face has five edges, uh, and it has 12 of them. And then the icosahedron. And um, OK, so these are your basic platonic solids. Um, and uh, I've got a, a slide here which shows some basic data about each one. Okay, so the tetrahedron has four faces and, uh, and maybe I'll put, so four faces and six edges and four vertices. And uh, the total number of symmetries is 24. You can, you can enter, uh, you can, exchange the edges or the vertices in any possible way and that gives you 24 different operations. And of those, some of those will uh, preserve handedness. Some of them will take left hands into left hands and right hands into right hands and others will switch the handedness of things. And the ones that preserve the handedness are called orientation preserving and that's half of them, 12. And uh, so we have similar facts for each of the um, each of the platonic solids. Uh, so a cube has six squares and 12 edges and eight vertices. Uh, and the octahedron has eight faces and 12 edges and six vertices. And uh, the, they both have 48 symmetries of which 24 are orientation preserving. And then the dodecahedron and the icosahedron are the most complicated ones Then uh, they have, uh, each has 30 edges, one has 12 um, 12 faces, the other one has 12 vertices, and they have 120 symmetries. So you can think of it in terms of, well, if you think of the pentagon, pentagonal face, you can rotate that five ways, or you can flip it over so that it would make 10 symmetries of the, uh, of the pentagonal face, and then there are 12 of those faces. So you can take any face, say to be the top face, that gives you 12 operations, and then times 10 that preserve the top face, so 120. Uh, okay, so well if we just look at this table, um, well we notice uh, that um, well most of the number, I mean the numbers might seem kind of random, and, but uh, some of them are the same, right? Like there's a four uh, four faces and four vertices for the tetrahedron. And uh, uh, there's tw six faces for the cube, but six vertices for the octahedron. And uh, then there's 12 edges of each. 
Um, and then over here, uh, the dodecahedron has 12 faces, and the uh, icosahedron has, has 12 vertices. So, and, uh, and then uh, there's an also another 12 down there in the corner with a number of uh, symmetries of the, of the tetrahedron. So there's actually five 12s in this table, and we might ask, um, is that just a coincidence? Or are they actually related? Are those uh, 12, uh, five 12s connected with each other? And in fact, uh, you probably guess I wouldn't ask the question if they weren't, so let me try to explain how. So the first uh, thing has to do with duality. So let me, so um, notice that for the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, uh, you have the same numbers of faces, edges, and vertices, but in the opposite order. So there's 12 faces uh, for the dodecahedron and 12 vertices for the icosahedron, and 20 uh, vertices for the dodecahedron and 20 faces for the icosahedron and 30 edges for each. Um, and this uh, is connected with uh, a phenomenon called duality, which was known to the Greeks, um, but it, probably, it took them about um, 200 years to discover it. They knew the regular solids in the, in the 6th century BC. The, uh, the Pythagoreans knew about the regular solids, but they didn't uh, know about duality until uh, the time of Plato, about 200 years later. Anyway, um, so you can see here that uh, you can put the, if, if, you, if you take the midpoint, the centers of the faces of the cube and you connect them together, that'll make an octahedron. Uh, so and so the, the vertices of the octahedron are in fact uh, connected in a one-to-one -one fashion with the, with, the ed with the faces of the cube and the uh, faces of the octahedron. Uh, over here you can do the same thing. You can put a cube inside an octahedron. So then the face of the cube is associated with the vertex of the icosahedron. And then you see the edges match up, like this edge here is matching with this edge here, and this edge is matching with this edge, and so forth. So in fact, duality uh, creates um, a natural correspondence between, um, between the, the faces and the edges of, of the two dual things. That, I mean, sorry, the faces and the vertices, and then the edges just match up. So that explains why, um, why you have a 12. So, uh, well, th this explains why you have the 6 for the vertices uh, of the octahedron, and then the 6 for the, uh, for the, faces for the cube, and then the edges match up, so that's the same 12. You can match the edges up in a one-to-one -one fashion, so they both have 12. And uh, similarly, there's a dodecahedron icosahedron duality. Um, and so you can see that, again, if you, if you, if you put, take points in the centers of the faces of the icosahedron, then that will give you um, 20 vertices, and if you connect them all together, that'll make a regular dodecahedron. So again, there's this duality that switches faces and uh, vertices and, and matches edges with edges. So that's why you have the same number of edges, those two numbers, the 30 is the same, but also the 12 of the, uh, of the faces of the um, dodecahedron is the same as the 12 vertices of the icosahedron. So, um, so we've now matched up uh, this, tw um, this 12 with this 12, and this 12 with this 12. Um, okay, so we have uh, two pairs of 12s matched up. Um, okay, and the f uh, for the rest, uh, this may this may suggest what's going on. This is um, this is a, a artwork by uh, the Dutch artist M. C. Escher, who was very fascinated with symmetry, and you can see that it's well. First of all, it's it's built on what's called a stellated dodecahedron. So what has happened here is that each face of the dodecahedron has been extended. Uh, so then all the, five, uh, all the five faces adjacent to one face come out and they make a, a cone, 
um, a, a, a pyramid with a pentagonal base. Okay, so that you can uh, you can enlarge. Let's see, this isn't me. No, 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 okay, okay, okay. Uh, you, so you can you can make this larger figure that has these points on the ends. It looks kind of like a star. So it's called the stellated dodecahedron. And that would have the same, because you do the same thing to every face, that would have the same symmetry as the, as the ordinary dodecahedron. But then he's, he's uh, out, of the, out of the pyramids on the faces, he's uh, out of the points, he's made these little houses and he's, he's um, put doors in the faces and he's put little animals in there and uh, the animals have four legs and a head and so they stick out of the five faces. I guess they have small tails. Um, and uh, so what has he done here? Uh, he's kind of destroyed the symmetry, right? I mean, so each face now can only have one possible orientation. So you might ask, well, does this have any symmetry at all? And, um, well, of course, I mean, all the animals are different colors. So if you insist on preserving the color, then you can't do anything. But if you imagine that they were all the same uh, shade, as, shade of gray as, as, as the um, polyhedron, then, then you might ask whether there could possibly be any symmetry here. And it turns out there is. And uh, it's related to... Uh, the a fact that some of you may know, which is that you can put a tetrahedron in a cube, okay? So you can, you can put a tetrahedron in a cube so that every other vertex of the cube uh, is a vertex of the tetrahedron. So the cube has eight vertices and the tetrahedron has four. So you can you bend the tetrahedron in the cube so it's occupying four of the vertices and no two of them are adjacent to each other. And uh, this, uh, this is quite a, remark this, uh, quite a remarkable fact, and this can only happen in three dimensions. Okay, this is something that's very special about three dimensions. Um, oops, this is the wrong way. Um, so the tetrahedron can be embedded in the cube, and the, when we do that, you can see that every symmetry of the tetrahedron comes from, extends to a symmetry of the cube. So the full symmetry of the tetrahedron is uh, respected by the by its being embedded in the cube. Um, and um, so we've said that there's, so there are 12 orientation preserving symmetries of the, of the tetrahedron. And if you look at the situation, uh, you can see that they will, so they'll move the edges around of the, um, of the, of the cube. And you can see that you can get from any edge to any other edge by doing that because you can write, if you rotate around one of these uh, corners of the tetrahedron, you'll interchange the three edges around that. And um, uh, you, you can see that by continuing to do that, you can just take any edge to any other edge. So uh, this, so if you fix one edge, then there's a unique orientation preserving symmetry of the tetrahedron that will take that to another edge. So you can set up uh, a, one, uh, a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between the symmetries of the tetrahedron, the orientation preserving symmetries of the tetrahedron, uh, which are also rotations, and the, uh, and the edges of the cube. So um, going back to our table, so that means that this 12 and this 12 are the same. And since this 12 and this 12 are the same, then those three 12s are the same. So now we have to see whether, whether these 12s have any connection with, uh, with those other 12s. And they do. Um, and the secret is, uh, so we have do this construction. We imagine you have a cube and you take a plane containing the edge of the cube um, and not cutting the cube. So sort of a plane going along the edge of the cube uh, at some slanted angle. Okay, and the cube is, that the, the plane divides space into two halves, and the cube is contained in one of the halves. Okay, and now rotate space by all the orientation-preserving symmetries of the tetrahedron, all the rotations of the tetrahedron. That will give you a, a, a a plane on each edge of the cube. 
So, and the cube, uh, then take all the half spaces that contain the cube, take the intersection of all those half spaces. That will give you a polyhedron, uh, which will have 12 sides, so it will be a dodecahedron, and uh, you can, you can uh, check that that, ha that will have pentagonal sides. Okay, so you can embed the cube in a, in a pentagon in such a way, uh, sorry, in, in a dodecahedron in, with pentagonal sides such that each edge of the cube is on one edge, one face of the dodecahedron. Now in general, that's not going to be the regular dodecahedron, but you can slant, you can slant that plane. And for exactly one position of the original plane, the dodecahedron will be the regular dodecahedron. So that in fact, uh, by this method, you get uh, a, a natural correspondence between the edges of the cube and the faces of the dodecahedron. And this, this, so this figure is a little bit complicated, but I hope that you can see uh, what's going on with it. So um, here, here is uh, uh, part of a cube, so, uh, and, then, um, and then you've got this pentagonal face uh, uh, aligned, aligned on, this, on this edge of the cube, okay? So, and there's another one coming up from the opposite face, so that you get this little figure on top of the face of the cube, you get this figure that looks kind of like a tent, right? It has uh, two... Um, trapezoidal faces and two triangular faces at the end. It looks like a tent. And as you vary the angle of the, of the plane, uh, the, the, length of the, uh, the length of the top edge of the, of the tent will vary, and the edges of these things will vary, and there's a unique position when they're all equal. And, uh, and then that gives you the regular dodecahedron. Okay, so in fact, um, uh, another way of looking at this is that you can, so you can embed, you can embed the cube in the dodecahedron so that each edge of the cube traverses one face of the dodecahedron. And then if you move that cu cube, if you move that cube around by the symmetries of the dodecahedron, you'll get a system of five cubes embedded in the dodecahedron. So indeed, then, uh, the, going back to the table, so, uh, so actually this 12 is the same as this 12, and so they're all the same 12. Okay. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay, and I might mention that um, if um, if you continue that process of rotating the cube until the two, if you, if, if you make the, the faces exactly, exactly this, make the same angle with both faces that, the, 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 that hit the edge, then the, um, the, the top, the, that uh, top edge of the tent will degenerate into a single point, and instead of being dodecahedra for that one unique position, the faces will actually be uh, quadrilaterals, and actually they'll be rhombuses, and the figure you get is the rhombic dodecahedron, which is a very symmetrical solid, but it's not a regular solid because the faces are rhombuses and not, um, not regular polygons. And, uh, okay. Okay, so then um, that's uh, some thoughts about three dimensions, and I'd like to go on and talk about the four-dimensional platonic solids. And uh, first, uh, they're, they're probably not uh, so familiar to you, so I'll just run a few, through a pic few pictures. But first, let me mention that um, four is the best dimension for regular solids. Um, above four dimensions, there are only three. They're the analogs of the tetrahedron, and the cube, and the octahedron. Uh, and that's all there are in dimensions bigger than four. But in four, uh, there are uh, the five cell. So this is, 
So these are uh, projection, well, th these are two-dimensional projections of three-dimensional projections of four-dimensional polyhedra. So you'll just sort of have to try to, uh, they'll just give you some vague idea of what they look like. But um, uh, there's, it's sort of like uh, here in this one, the, um, the, the big, te so there's an outside tetrahedron, and then there are four um, on each face, there, there's a, there's a, it's connected to a tetrahedron, so that gives you four more tetrahedra, altogether five tetrahedra, this is the five cell. Okay, and then there's an eight cell, this is the analog of the cube, it's also called the hypercube or the four cube or sometimes the tesseract. And this is probably the best known one, you may have seen a picture of this, uh, it's most commonly seen. And then there's an analog of the octahedron, it's called the 16 cell, and uh, again, so it, it has a, a large uh, outside tetrahedron and then a small tetrahedron inside and then you connect the edges in all possible ways and this all together makes, uh, makes 14, uh, 14 tetrahedra, which are the faces of the hyperoctahedron. And then there's this one, which is the 24 cell, and uh, we'll be coming back to that. It's uh, and the 120 cell is sort of the analog of the dodecahedron. It's, uh, it has 120 three-dimensional faces, which are regular dodecahedra. And then there's a dual of the 120 cell, which is the 600 cell. It has 600 three-dimensional faces, which are just tetrahedra. Okay, and this is another picture of the 120 cell, which you can actually make for yourself if you want. This is this, this is a little kit called Zone Tool, and uh, it's available. You can find it online if you Google Zone Tool, and and you can build. Uh, well, that that the the, the, <coughs> the thing I showed you before with a cube inside the dodecahedron was also made with Zone Tool, and you can make all kinds of geometric constructions with it. Anyway, uh, so here's the table describing the Platonic 4D solids. Um, and you see again, so there are, uh, with the 120 cell and the 600 cell, you see that the three-dimensional, oops, the three-dimensional faces and the vertices are reversed, and the two-dimensional faces and the edges are reversed, so there's, there's a duality here, and likewise there's a duality between the 8 cell and the 16 cell. And uh, again, the five cell, the tetrahedron analog, is self-dual, so they're the same number of faces as vertices. And uh, um, so there, you see there. Then uh, there, there are many fewer uh, um, coincidences here, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. What I really want to talk about is the 24 cell, which is an absolutely unique object in the universe. So the all the polyhedra that I put, the five polyhedra that I put on the previous slide are all obvious analogs of their three-dimensional neighbors. But this guy are, are three-dimensional things. But, but this guy here is the sixth one. It's sort of the odd man out. It has no analog in three dimensions. And it, 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 uh, it exists because of some remarkable coincidences that happen only uh, in four dimensions. Uh, so in particular, it's self-dual. Uh, it has 24 octahedral faces and 24 vertices, 96 uh, edges and 96 planar faces. Um, okay, and to really understand uh, the 24 cell properly, uh, we need to talk about uh, quaternions. So I'm going to digress into quaternions a little bit here. And um, so the quaternions should be, I mean, uh, they deserve to be better known than they are, and uh, so I'm going to give you a, a small primer about them. Uh, so you probably met the complex numbers in high school as just sums of A plus IB, where A and B were real numbers. But in, in, a, a better way to meet them might be to meet them as two by two matrices. So uh, if you take um, this matrices of the form A and then minus B, B A, uh, you will find that when you multiply two of these together, you get a, a, another matrix of the same form. So, so that these guys form a little, 
uh, set inside the two by two matrices that's closed under addition and multiplication, and uh, they give you a copy of the complex numbers. So, uh, in some, if you believe in linear algebra, you have to believe in the complex numbers. They're 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 just sort of a little byproduct of two by two matrices. And the quaternions, uh, and uh, just before we go on here, let me notice that notice that the determinant of this matrix is a squared minus minus b squared. So that's a squared plus b squared. Uh, which is um, which is the Euclidean square length of that vector of a b as considered as a vector. It's the usual Euclidean norm squared on R two. And since it's a determinant, and you know determinant is multiplicative, it follows that the, 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 this norm of the product is the product of the norms. And as a consequence of that, if you think of the uh, the complex numbers of norm one. So which you can identify with the unit circle in the plane, it has, it has this property that it's closed under multiplication and, well, and inversion. So it has the structure of a group. And in fact, it's the sim it is a symmetry group of rotations of the plane. Okay, so the quaternions are quite analogous to the complex numbers. Uh, so we can make them out of also two by two matrices, but this time the two by two matrices should be complex numbers. And what we do, instead of putting just minus, uh, the, instead of having the second column be just exactly the same as the first column, we, we apply complex conjugation to the second column. So the matrix is A minus A, then B in the lower corner, and then minus B bar and A bar, where bar stands for complex conjugation. Um, and again, you can check that uh, if you take the determinant of this matrix, it's just the sum of the uh, square norms of A and B. Uh, so we call that the norm of uh, norm squared of, of, of Q, the quaternion. And this is the usual Euclidean norm on, uh, on four-dimensional space. And in particular, because the, uh, again, because of the determinant relation, you see that the uh, norm is multiplicative. The norm of a product is the product of the norms. And therefore, if you take the quaternions of norm one, which is the three-dimensional sphere in four-dimensional space, uh, then it also is a group. It's closed under the multiplication. Oops. Uh-oh. Oh, I just, okay. Uh, and um, <coughs> so usually uh, the quaternions are described in terms of a basis. So if we take uh, these are t four simple matrices of, of the desired form, I, the identity matrix, and then I, J, and K. And um, if we just single these out and see how they multiply, um, let's see. You, you, we can express any we can express any quaternion as a sum of of, of those guys. If we take the, if we take the real component of the quaternion to be zero, then we get what are called pure quaternions. And this, so this is the three-dimensional space. So inside the quaternions, you have a copy of the real numbers, which goes through the identity. And then you have a perpendicular space, which uh, consists of the pure quaternions. And uh, if you look how the, those guys multiply, you see that the square of each one of them is minus one. And then, uh, and then the product of two of them is plus or minus the other guy, depending on the order in which you multiply. And if you switch the order of multiplication, you switch the sign. So quaternions are usually defined, you know, you, they say, OK, here, here you've got these units, and this is how they multiply. And it seems very unmotivated. But they're, they're, they're a natural object. They just live there as, as two by two matrices. And then, and then you single out some reasonable guys, and you get this, these multiplica multiplicative relations. And again, there's uh, just like complex conjugation, there's quaternionic com conjugation, where you change the sign of the scalars in front of the, th the three i, j's, and k's. OK. Um, so uh, we take the, the three-dimensional sphere. We call those the unit quaternions. And uh, that's, we said that's a group under multiplication. Um, so we can do, uh, we can, uh, do things to quaternions with that. So we can, oops. 
I'm trying to treat this as a pointer, and it's not. Um, so we can multiply, we can take a typical quaternion and multiply it on the left by a unit quaternion. This will preserve the quaternionic norm, so it will act as a rotation of four dimensional space. Or we can multiply on the right by the quaternion. I, I've made the inverse, that will sort of makes things come out a little nicer. Um, and again, this will preserve the norm, so again, that is a rotation of four dimensional space. Um, and if I do both of these, if I multiply on the right by Q and on the, uh, on the left by Q and on the right by Q inverse, then doing both of those together, you see if, I, if X is the identity, I'll mul just be multiplying Q times Q inverse, and I'll just get the identity back. So if I do both of them together, I will preserve the real numbers, and therefore I preserve the orthogonal subspace of the pure quaternions. And so this, that operation will, of course, preserve the norm, and it will, it will preserve the norm in the pure quaternions. So this is actually acting as a rotation of the three-dimensional space of the pure quaternions. So uh, this means, so if we, if we, um, if we multiply by an arbitrary quaternion on the right, left, and another arbitrary quaternion on the left, we'll get some rotation of four-dimensional space. This gives it <coughs> a map <coughs> from a copy of two quaternions into the, the group of four-dimensional rotations. And uh, if we do them together, if we do uh, left, left multiplication and right multiplication by the same quaternion, then we will get this uh, a rotation of three-dimensional space. So we get these mappings from either two copies or one copy of the quaternions to rotations in four-dimensional and three-dimensional space. And both of these mappings are, are onto you. We get every single rotation of four-dimensional space uh, by doing that, by, by multiplying left and right by arbitrary quaternions, we get every rotation of three-dimensional space by this left and right at the same time. And, uh, and also, both of these maps are exactly two to one. It will take, there will be two guys upstairs which go to one guy downstairs. This is because uh, of minus one. Minus one, it doesn't matter whether you multiply on the left or on the right, it's the same thing. So this gives two to one mappings from uh, two copies of the quaternions or one copy of the quaternions to the, these rotation groups. And this, so this, among other things, this shows you that uh, geometry in, in four dimensions and in three dimensions are very closely related to each other and they're both controlled by uh, this, uh, by this group of unit quaternions. Okay, so let's, what does this have to do with the regular solids? Well, um, if we take uh, the hyperoctahedron, the 16 cell, so the, uh, if you think about this, the octahedron is sitting in three, three the normal octahedron sitting in three-dimensional space, it just has, its vertices are like up and down the z-axis, up and down the x-axis, up and down the y-axis. Its vertices are just the point, the unit vectors along the axes. And in four dimensions, it's the same thing. So if we treat the four dimensions as quaternions, the vertices of the 16 cell will be plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. And uh, we can just observe, we saw what the multiplic multiplicative relations of these guys are, and so we know that this set is closed under quaternionic multiplication. So the 16 cell, the hyperoctahedron, in fact, is a group. Uh, um, now, if we take uh, the uh, hypercube, so uh, the usual, I mean, so the usual way to, uh, to put the cube in coordinates is to put one vertex at the origin and then uh, one, uh, all the coordinates which can be zero or one, right? You, all the points which have coordinates equal to zero or one. But we could translate that back and if we put the, if we put the center of the cube uh, at the origin, then we would be looking at all points whose, uh, whose vertices are plus or minus a half. 
So we can do that same thing here in four dimensions. So we just take plus or minus 1, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k, and then uh, divide, them by, divide that by 2. We'll get the uh, 4 cube with unit sides uh, centered at the origin. Um, and interestingly, these are unit quaternions, right? If you just compute the norm of that, it's the norm of a half or a half or i over 2 or j over 2 or k over 2, the norm squared of that is a quarter. So you add up four of them, you get one. So these are actually unit quaternions. And again, this is another unique thing about four dimensions. The only time when the, no, the, when the unit four cube centered at the origin will sit on the unit sphere is in four dimensions. Okay, so, uh, so maybe you think, oh, well, this, so this is going to turn out to be a group also. Well, not quite. Okay, so it's not a group. <coughs> However, uh, going back, see, if you see, if you take one of these guys and you multiply it by i or j or k, Right? You're just going to rearrange these things. If I multiply by i, this will turn into i, this will turn into minus 1, this will turn into uh, k, this will turn into minus j. So you'll just be rearranging those coordinates. So m if I multiply these guys by the elements of the, uh, of the hyperoctahedral group, then I will preserve that 16 cells. So the hyperoctahedral group is functioning as a set of symmetries of the, of the 16 cell. And what happens is that the elements actually of the 16 cell um, uh, normalize. That means if, you, if, if I do the left and right multiplication at the same time of one of the elements of J, uh, that will preserve J. So the, if I put them together, um, if I put the hypercube together with J, uh, then I get a group. So the union of the vertices and, uh, and the hypercube together forms a group, which I'll call BT, uh, which has order 24. Um, so, and the J then is a subgroup. Uh, it uh, of, has one-third the size, size 8. So that's called index 3. Uh, and then um, if, if, if you take that group BT and you, uh, and you map it by, by the conjugation mapping to, to SO3, you'll get exactly the rotations of the tetrahedron, and since that mapping is 2 to 1, uh, this is called the binary tetrahedral group. So that's why the, that's the meaning of the BT. Okay? Yeah? So you said before that in 4D is the only place where you can write this linear combination and it squares the norm is 1. Right. But does it not depend on the normalization of the one half? Couldn't you choose another dimension? Uh, so uh, I'm, 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 letting the, I'm letting the sides be one, right? Uh, the sides, I mean, if I take, uh, right, the sides of, those, of that cube is one. So that's why I'm normalizing the side of the cube to have length one. Yeah, you, you can always embed a, a cube in, 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 in a sphere of some radius, but, but for the fact that the unit cube is embedded in the unit sphere only happens in four dimensions. Okay, so, uh, so the, the cube together with, uh, the, uh, I, uh, to, with, uh, with the 16 cell, the 8 cell and the 16 cell together form a group, the binary tetrahedral group. And that is in fact the 24 cell. The 24 cell is a set, is a set of vertices, or the, the, the BT is the set of vertices of the 24 cell. So the 24 cell is also a group. And uh, so <coughs> it contains uh, three interlocking copies of the, of the hyperoctahedron, or the 16 cell, or three interlocking copies of the hypercube. Uh, um, and any two of those cubes intersect in a 16 cell. 
So um, uh, you can see that, that why four dimensions is so special, it really is because of, of the quaternions and the fact that these regular polyhedra are, are, are really, I mean, they, they're as symmetric as they can be, they're just groups themselves. Um, okay, um, uh, and let me make another remark here. So we can, you can, if you take the ordinary cube, uh, right, um, and think of it in term of, as having coordinates zero and one, you can think of it as a group. You just add, you just take any two of the uh, vert uh, vertices of the, of the cube and you add them together. And if you get a two, you reduce that to zero. So this will give you a, a little group of order eight. You can think of it as just the, the, it, the adding, like adding uh, one coordinate just sort of switches the sides of the cube. It's a reflection of the cube. Uh, and similarly, if you do that in four dimensions, you'll get, uh, you'll get a group of order 16. Um, and when, uh, if the 16 cell is embedded in the four cube, uh, which it is automatically in the geometry of the 24 cell, then uh, it will form actually a subgroup uh, of order eight. Uh, so it is, it's, as a group, it's isomorphic to the three cube. Of course, it's not isometric to the three cube. This is, doesn't have the same uh, metric structure, but it, it, as, as, a, as an algebraic structure, it's the same. So the, the 16 cell actually has uh, first of all, I should say, this is the four-dimensional analog of the tetrahedron in the cube. Instead of, instead of a tetrahedron, we can embed an octahedron inside, a, a four-octahedron inside the four cube. Um, and uh, because of this, the 16 cell actually supports two group structures, one of which is this just uh, commutative, which doesn't matter the order of the operations that you do, and then the, the multiplicative group of quaternions, the order does matter. Okay. Uh, and let's, let me just remark that the 600 cell has a similar story. Uh, the 120 vertices of the 600 cell also form a group, the binary icosahedral group, which actually contains uh, the binary tetrahedral group. And um, it's mapped to the uh, group by the RL map to the group of rotations of the icosahedron. So again, uh, the, this is why uh, you see why um, regular solids are so wonderful in four dimensions that they're, they, they're, they're, they're the essence of symmetry themselves. They're almost their own, uh, they sort of create their own operations. Okay, and uh, if you add one more uh, set of things. So if I take any two, um, if I take any, uh, any two of I, plus or minus i, j, and k, uh, which, are not, uh, which are not opposites of each other, so they don't cancel to zero, and add them together, I'll get a quaternion. Uh, so it will have a square norm two. Um, and um, this, well, we will, I, I have to explain this later, but I, 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 these, these are what are known as the root vectors of the D4 lattice, and we'll meet the D4 lattice in a little, in a little while. Okay, so, and also if I, if I divide them by a one over root two to, uh, or if I multiply them by one over root two to get a normal one, uh, then th these guys will normalize the group J and the group BT, and then so they together with J give a group of order of size 48, uh, which is called the binary octahedral group. It's uh, under the map R LR, it turns into the rotations of the cube. Okay, uh, so there's this behind the uh, Behind the regular solids in four dimensions, there's, uh, in some sense, you're getting at the essence of group theory by, by looking at the four dimensional regular solids. And, that's, and the 24 cell, you get this absolutely unique thing. Okay, so I would like then to um, uh, raise the question whether there's any larger significance of this. Okay, so 
Um, we've met, the, we met the, uh, the number 12 quite a few times and we found that really it was only one 12. And uh, we met the number 24 in a kind of a prominent way. And um, both 12 and 24 are very prominent in the theory of finite simple groups. Uh, so the classification of the finite simple groups uh, was one of the great uh, accomplishments of 20th century mathematics. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about where that you see the 12 and the 24 there and, and, um, and, whether, and ask the question whether there might be some connections. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so it's just a question. But anyway, um, uh, the classification of finite simple groups uh, says that um, they're basically three, it, it divides them into three families. The first one is just uh, permutations. So you take all permutations of a set of any, a finite set of any size, except you, again, you worry about the, uh, the, the, um, the orientation issue, and, and you take the analog of orientation preserving um, uh, permutations. So, so that's called the alternating group, and those, those are the alternating <coughs> groups are sim simple as, um, as long as the number of objects is at least five, and that's, uh, that's sort of the, uh, the root of, of, um, of Galois' theory. This, this was, this is, related to the, the fact that you can solve third order equations and fourth order equations with, with, um, with radicals, but you can't solve fifth order equations with radicals. And this was Galois' great discovery. And then there's a large family of, of groups which are called groups of Lie type, uh, which uh, is an infinite number. It sort of has two infinite parameters associated with it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then there's three, there's 26 other groups which haven't been linked, you know, put into a systematic framework. So those are called sporadic groups. Uh, so this was the big theorem of, of, of the 20th century in group theory, that these are the collection of finite, simple groups. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Um, so let me talk about the Lie groups. Um, so the, the Lie groups uh, are, are divided into um, four infinite families of what are called classical groups. They're associated with obvious uh, kinds of geometries. And then there's five groups which have been harder to understand. Uh, they're still a little bit mysterious. They're called the exceptional groups. So again, within the groups of Lie type, you have sort of a normal family, uh, infinite normal family, and then a few exceptions. So the classical groups are uh, the uh, well the linear groups. So what you t you take the group you take all invertible matrices uh, n by n matrices. That's a that's a group, uh, and then you do a little bit uh, you do a little bit to it to make it simple, and uh, that's called the linear group. Um, and actually, the n there refers to the n plus one by n plus one matrices for odd reasons. Um, and then uh, there are orthogonal groups. And uh, from the point of view of structure, uh, it's been thought to best divide them into the odd dimensional orthogonal groups and the even dimensional orthogonal groups. So these are the n dimensional analogs of the rotation groups in three dimensions. And then there's a family of symplectic groups, which is a l not as well known, but just as important. Uh, and they, uh, they preserve, instead of preserving a symmetric inner product, they preserve an anti-symmetric inner product, and they're very important in theoretical physics and classical mechanics. And then there are these five exceptional groups, uh, which are called G2, F4, and E6, 7, and 8. Uh, and uh, these are their dimensions, and I won't try to say very much more about them. Uh, OK. Um, so. It turns out that uh, to understand the theory of groups turns out to be very intimately connected with the geometry of lattices. And in particular, uh, the connection goes like this, that if you have a simple Lie group, it, 
<coughs> its structure is controlled by a, a system of combinatorial data called the root system. And the root system is really best regarded as belonging to a certain lattice uh, called the root lattice. So I want to talk about this group lattice connection a little bit. So I'm going to just talk about lattices. And lattices, by a lattice, I, I just mean uh, a system of uh, point, regularly spaced points in the plane. So you start at the origin and you choose some vector, some two vectors, and then you take all possible sums of those vectors and you get this regularly spaced set of points. And um, in, this, in this picture here, uh, what we've got is, so this is the origin and then I have rotated the plane and, uh, and dilated it so that the shortest vector in the lattice is this just unit vector in the x direction. And then you can show that a, a second vector of the lattice will always live inside this strip like this. So in some sense, this vertical strip bounded by the unit circle on the bottom is a picture uh, of all possible lattices in the plane. Uh, so let me just uh, run through a few of those. So if, 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 the, if that second point is right over here, uh, the unit vector in the y direction, then you just get the usual square lattice that everybody is most familiar with. You've seen a lot of that. You see it on floors all the time. If, if that second vector is over here at the halfway point between uh, the 0 and 1 here, then you get the hexagonal lattice. So the, <coughs> the points of the lattice, the, there will be six points of the lattice on the unit circle and they will form a regular hexagon. So that's called the hexagonal lattice. And then uh, if, if the second point moves up this vertical, the y-axis a little bit, then the, uh, the regions, the fundamental regions of the lattice become rectangles rather than squares, so that's called a rectangular lattice. Um, if, the, uh, if the point moves along the, uh, the unit circle, then those two vectors are both unit vectors, so the fundamental domain will have side, all side one, uh, so it's a rhombus, and the, the diagonal is uh, the diagonal is longer than the uh, sides, so I call that a fat rhombus. And then if if the if that second point comes down here to the hexagonal lattice and then moves up here, well this. This fundamental domain doesn't look particularly interesting, but if I instead, if I divide it like that, if I take half of this one and half of this one, again you see you get a rhombus, but now the diagonal is shorter than the sides, so I call that the thin rhombic lattice. So uh, you can see that um, this, this, the region, the location of that second point in this region sort of reflects the geometry of the lattice, and in particular, uh, the lattice, lattices have a lot of interesting geometry and um, the most, in some sense the most interesting lattices are the ones where that second point is in a corner, right? Is in a corner of the region of lattices. So those two, the, uh, the square lattice and the hexagonal lattice, in some sense are the most uh, special lattices. They're the lattices with the most symmetry. And sort of the goal of, of uh, the theory of lattices is, is to find these, these tricky little lattices that live in the corners of the lattice space uh, in higher dimensions. Okay, so um, if you're going to study things in higher dimensions, you can't have just pictures, so you have to uh, have some way of <coughs> <coughs> some features that you want to single out. And the first is, um, are they integral? So uh, you can look at all the points of the lattice and you, can, and you can take their square norms, you can take their inner products, and you say, well, are, if those are all integers, then I'll call it an integral lattice. And um, uh, then you can ask about the length of the shortest vectors. And of course, um, 
it's easy to make a lattice with, uh, you, you're more interested in a lattice if the length of the shortest vectors is long. But you don't want to do it in a stupid way, right? You could just take a lattice and just dilate everything uh, and make things with a very large minimal length, but, uh, but then there would, the fundamental domain would be very large. So you want to control, you want to control the size of the fundamental domain at the same time that you make the, the shortest vectors long. So you look at what's called the index, which is a measure of the fundamental domain. So the index is like this. You assume, so if you, <clears throat> if you have a lattice, uh, then you look at the, what's called the dual lattice. So you look at all the vectors that have integral inner product with, with everything in the lattice. Um, then if you can show that that's also a lattice. And if the lattice is integral, then it will be contained in its dual. Uh, so if, it, if it's equal to its dual, we say it's self-dual. But in general, the, the quotient L star over L will measure the deviation from self-duality. So uh, this is an important variant. It's called the index. OK. So to just summarize, I mean, we sort of look for hard to find lattices. We like them to be integral. Uh, we like to have them have large minimal length. And we'd like that all that would be bigger than one. If it's equal to one, you can show that in some sense you can just cut off that vector and, and, and make a smaller lattice that might be more interesting. So uh, you're, you're, we're come kind of completely not interested in lattices with vectors of length one, integral lattices with vectors of length one. So if all the squared lengths are even, then we call it an even lattice. We, that's a nice property. And we like the lattices to have small index. So the ideal things that we like to look for are even self-dual lattices. Um, and so they've been investigated quite a bit, and they're pretty rare. Uh, and it turns out that the first one occurs in dimension 8, and it's called E8, and it is indeed uh, the lattice related to the Lie group E8. It's the root lattice for E8. In dimension 16, uh, there are only two. One is you just take two copies of E8. And the other one uh, is not too hard to construct, but I, I won't describe it. Um, it's, it's not too different from that. And then in dimension 24, things get substantially more interesting. It turns out that there is exactly 24 even self-dual lattices. 23 of them are, based, are related to Lie theory in, in significant ways. They're based on root systems. And then the 24th one is, uh, is quite... It's another unique object in the universe. And it's called the Leech lattice. And so it's the, it's the only minimal self-dual lattice, uh, uh, only even self-dual lattice in 24 dimensions in which the minimal length is 4. Okay, so this is, um, uh, so uh, it's in dimension 24, okay? There's another 24. Uh, OK, so let me describe the root lattices a little bit. Uh, so the a lattices a n attached to the linear groups, you just you take a lattice in <coughs> you take all the um, integral I should have said, uh, okay, so this should be integral integral points. You take all points with integer values, and the total sum of all the coordinates is zero. That's the a n lattice. And it has a basis where you just take one basis vector minus the previous vector. <coughs> Go ahead. <coughs> um, and, uh, those, and those are its, notice that these guys have squared length 2. <coughs> and they're, they're the, they're the so-called roots of the lattice. They're the vectors of minimal length. And it has index n plus 1. So it's uh, not so huge, but, um, but it's, not, it's not one. So it's not a self, AN is not a self-dual lattice. Okay, and uh, so as I said, the, the EI minus EJ, plus or, I should say plus or minus that, um, <coughs> is, um, are, are the roots, and there's N times N plus one of them. 
Okay, and then there's the DN lattices. Uh, and this is quite easy to describe. So you take all the integral <laughs> vectors in n space and you require that the sum of the coordinates is even. If you do this in two dimensions, you get what is sometimes called the checkerboard lattice, right? You'll get the, you'll get the integral points, but only every other one. So the, the regions, uh, the fundamental regions look like diamonds. It's co sometimes called the checkerboard lattice. And again, um, so you can describe a basis, the minimal length is two, and now the index is only four. So this is coming closer to being uh, self-dual, but it isn't quite. Uh, and I, I yeah, so <coughs> the lattice for D4, um, together with the quaternions uh, 2q in the binary tetrahedral group, generate another root la uh, lattice for one of the exceptionally groups, the lat root lattice for E4. And uh, as I said before, the, uh, the, the, root f the D4 root lattice is intimately related to the 24 cell. It's, um, it is the vertices of the, what's called the dual 24 cell. If it, so if you take the the vertices of the 24 cell, and instead of connecting them together, you draw a tangent plane to the sphere at each one. Then the vertices of that figure will be these uh, roots of D4. Uh, so there, there's, there's a direct connection. So here, are a, a direct connection between the 24 and two of, uh, of, the, of the Lie groups, one classical Lie group and one exceptional Lie group. Okay. And then, so here's E8. What you do is you just take um, D8, and then you take this vector here, one, uh, <coughs> one half of uh, one, 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 that. And the point is that E8 uh, is the first dimension when this, so this, this vector here, the vector of half all ones, will be an integral vector when, when, when n is a multiple of 4. And 8 is the place where it just has exactly length 2. So it is, again, a root. Um, and uh, <coughs> so the roots of this lattice, of course, are the roots of d8. Again, uh, uh, if, I haven't, if I haven't said it clearly, the, a root is any vector of length 2. So all these root lattices have minimal length 2, and the roots are the vectors of length 2. Uh, and uh, so you get an extra root vector here, but also you can change signs of some of these coordinates by adding, by adding unit uh, or integral vectors to them, and you can change an even number of signs at a time. And if, so if you change an even number of signs at a time, altogether you can get uh, <coughs> 200 and, uh, 216 of these guys and 24 of those guys for 240 roots in all. So E8 has uh, 240 roots, and um, you can construct it uh, from, directly from E8. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, I want to tell you finally uh, way, another way of constructing uh, uh, lattices it involves something called codes. So uh, a code, what's the idea of a code? Uh, the code is much more general than what I'm going to talk about now, but this is just a simple version. So if I take any set and any subset of set, then I let A bar be the complementary set, the things that are not in A. So then I want to define an operation on sets. Uh, well, the, the familiar operations are the intersection, where you take all the elements in both A and B, and uh, the union, where you take all the elements in either A or B. <clears throat> and I want to define plus to be all the elements that are in A but not in B, or in B but not in A. So, uh, so this is sometimes called the symmetric difference, and it can also be expressed as the union and then take away the intersection. And th this operation of plus actually defines a perfectly good operation, algebraic operations. It gives you what's called the set z mod 2 to the n, or to the x, where x uh, number of elements in x. The zero element is the empty set. Uh, and 
It satisfies all the rules of arithmetic. The only odd thing is that when you add anything to itself, you get zero. Uh, and then a code is just any, uh, a, well, it's a binary linear code, a special kind of a code. It's just any set of subsets that's closed under this multiplication. In other words, some subgroup of x. <coughs> um, let me give you an example of this. Uh, of this addition. So here I've got my, my set is the set of vertices of the cube. And uh, so here is one set like this side here, these four vertices, another set, these four vertices, this side. And then uh, if I add them together, I, I, I take all the things, but then I cross out the ones in the intersection. So the sum will be this guy here with these four vertices, these two vertices, and these four. So those four vertices, uh, they, they're like a diagonal slice of the cube. So we can say that side by, plus side equals diagonal. Okay, and there's some basic parameters of codes. Codes are described by the length. That's just the number of elements in X. D is the dimension, and W is the word length. And what they are is the length is just the number of elements in X. Uh, the number of elements in the code will be always a power of two, and that's called the dimension. And then uh, you're interested in uh, the how many element, how many guys are in each one of these A's. And uh, you like to have codes in which the smallest elements uh, have a pretty big size. So that's called the word length. Okay, so you're interested in. Uh, <coughs> So this is the dimension. So this is the Hamming code. It's one of the uh, very early codes and one of the most important. And um, what it is, it's an eight-dimensional code. Uh, uh, so it's, it's in length eight, dimension four, and the minimal code word has length four. And in fact, it has 16 code words. So one of them is the empty set. One of them is the whole set. And then all the other code words, all 14 other code words, all have size 4. And you can show that there's only one such code. And I'd like to give you an example of, of, of these things using the cube again. So the cube has eight vertices. And you can make a, a Hamming code by taking uh, the six sides. So you take any one of the six sides. You take the four vertices of that. Uh, and the diagonal slices, uh, you, there's six of those. And then uh, the, the tetrahedra, the vertices of the two possible tetrahedra. So this gives you six plus six plus two, that's 14. Those are the sets of size four of a Hamming code. And we've seen that like this guy plus the one over here gives you one of the diagonals and you can just go through and check that um, that uh, always when you take a sum, it's another one of these guys. Um, <clears throat> this is also known as the Reed-Muller code of size 1, 3. I like to call it the Fourier code because I'm a harmonic analyst. And if you, uh, if you think of uh, this, uh, the theory of Fourier series on, on this little group, uh, if you think of the cube as a group and you think of the theory of Fourier series, then these uh, sets are just the... Uh, are just the level sets of the of the uh, of the characters of the group. So, um, uh, but there's other ways to make the Hamming code on on the sphere. Also, uh, <coughs> we could take the two tetrahedra together with what I call left-hand paths. So you go along here and then up there, and you're going along the, the, this face, and then you turn left to get to the other vertex. So there's 12 left-hand paths and two tetrahedra, and they also make a Hamming code. Or we could take uh, corners and diagonals. So again, we take the diagonals, but then we add the eight corners. Okay, so you take one corner and, and the three adjacent vertices, call that a corner, and, um, and then you get, again, 14 sets that will make a Hamming code. So there's lots of ways to realize the Hamming code uh, in terms of the geometry of the cube. Uh, so, turns out you can use the Hamming code to construct E8, and this is typical of how you use codes to construct lattices. We take the normal cubic lattice, except we dilate it by square root of 2, so now all of its, all of its um, 
vectors have, <coughs> have lengths multiples of two, then the dual will be one half of it, okay? Uh, because you've, you've, you've dilated the inner product by square root of two. So, uh, so the quotient is just, uh, you take the standard basis elements and just it's, the, it's, the, it's just the collection of, of subsets of that standard basis element will be, you can use that to realize the, uh, the quotient, L star modulo L. And then if you take any Hamming code in L star modulo L, that will generate a self-dual lattice um, which will in fact be the E8 lattice. And the lattice is even because all the code words have lengths that are multiples of four. And it's uh, also self-dual for the same reason. And then the roots will be uh, the standard basis vectors because we've dilated them by two. And then all the representatives of the code words uh, which all together will give you 240 uh, roots. So again, uh, this will, is another way to generate the lattice E8. So you see that the, the cube and the geometry of the cube uh, can be used to construct uh, the exceptional the algebra E8. Okay, now I've gone kind of over time, but I'd just like to finish up quickly. So uh, <clears throat> the more exotic part of this classification is the sporadic groups, and here they are. Here's half of them. I won't say much about them except these are the Mathieu groups. These were discovered in the 19th century. The rest are all products of the effort at classification in the late 20th century. Uh, so here's half of them and here's the other half. And this last one here is called the monster. It's huge. It's far larger than all the other ones put together. Uh, and then these groups here are the Conway groups. They're associated with the Leech lattice. Okay, so in particular this one is the, the group of symmetries of the Leech lattice up to plus or minus one. Okay, so the Leech lattice uh, gives rise to, uh, <coughs> or is an important part of constructing the sporadic groups. And in fact, uh, there are 12 sporadic groups which are in, uh, related to the Leech lattice. So the Leech lattice gives you a large chunk, uh, not the majority, but still a large part of the, uh, of the set of sporadic groups. Um, so, uh, and in, the, in particular, all the Matthew groups, the earliest sporadic groups, are related to the Leech lattice. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we get the Leech lattice? Well, it's, it comes out of another code, which ca is called the Gole code. So it's a dimension 24 code, which is the dimension of the Leech lattice. Uh, and uh, it's 12 dimensional, and it's minimal. Uh, word length is eight, okay, and that's what's special. It has this very long, minimal word length, which means, uh, <coughs> uh, and it turns out that it has 70, 759 code words of length eight. They're called octads, okay. And um, here is a, there's a there's a classical construction of the E8 lattice uh, or the Gole code called the Turin construction. What you can, which is you, you start with Hamming codes. You take two different Hamming codes, uh, C and C prime, and uh, you want these two Hamming codes to be related to each other in such a way that the only common code words are the empty set and the whole set. So among the examples I uh, showed you before, the CD and the PT examples would be such a pair of Hamming codes. So you could take those two and then you form, you, you take three copies uh, of, of, of your set of size eight, and you, uh, you form code words of the following nature. You take, co you take a fixed code word from one of the Hamming codes, and then you take three code words from the other Hamming code, which add up to zero, okay? So that's basically, you take two code words from the other one, and then the third one is the sum of those two. And uh, you can show that this guy gives you a Gole code. So you can construct the Gole code uh, from the Hamming code. And, um, <coughs> and then the Gole code lets you construct the Leech lattice in very much the same way that uh, you could construct the E8 lattice from the Hamming code. Uh, so, uh, so the Gole code uh, shows you how to construct the Leech lattice. 
And so now I'll just leave you with this thought. Is there a connection to the 24 cell? So, well, uh, um, right, we can, um, the 24 cell has 24 vertices, that's pretty good. But not only that, it naturally falls into three sets of eight vertices, namely the vertices of the 16 cell and the two transforms of that inside the 24 cell. And we can think, we, the, the uh, J can be thought of as a, as a group isomorphic to the three cube, so we can transfer we can transfer these two codes to J by means of this isomorphism and perform the Tiran construction. So you can make the Gole code live on the 24 cell. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, at least there's a formal connection uh, between the 24 cell and the, uh, and the Leach lattice, and therefore a, f a formal connection between a large chunk of, of um, sporadic group theory, and so I just leave it as a, maybe a homework exercise to see if, uh, if you can make this uh, simplify the, the theory in any way. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, I, c I mean, they're just sort of nicer, uh, uh, they, um, their geometry is more, and they're, they're, um, they will even, so even lattice, in particular, uh, <coughs> an even lattice, um, what do I want to say, um, uh, the root lattices are even lattices, and uh, so an even, uh, an even lat and the converse is true. An even lattice that is generated by its, uh, that is generated by its vectors of length two, of square length two, uh, is a root lattice. So there's a very nice theory of of of, of that class of lattices. So and it's so it's one of these actually. So when we the the <coughs> that it's either a lattice of type a n or d n or e six seven eight, or it's a sum of those lattices, sum of such lattices. So um, uh, I guess it's because so the, the you want to continue that theory and you want to say well there are then I mean the next question is so are there are there lattices that are that nice, but are even better in the sense that their their minimal length words are little minimal length vectors are even longer, and the Leech lattice is the first example of that. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the classification of uh, finite simple groups. Yeah. Which uh, consists of uh, three families, three types. Right. Uh, it's, it's no um, I think, well, this is actually, I think it's still, um, you, there are grounds for having reservations, but the, the classification, it seems the, the people that have worked on the project have, have gone through the literature and have cleaned it up a great deal and have written several books that sort of boil down the arguments so that um, they feel uh, much more confident of it now than, uh, than say, 30 years ago. Um, but uh, there is still room for some skepticism. Yeah. Okay. So what's the easiest construction method of the master group in the flow? Um, the, uh, the, actually, the monster group is also related to the Leech lattice. 
it, it can be uh, <coughs> uh, it can be realized as a as a permutation group on I believe it's the uh, the vectors of length eight in the Leech lattice. So uh, the the, 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 you can also describe important aspects of the, of the monster group uh, using the Leech lattice, although it's a, it's a much larger group and it, it, uh, it doesn't, it lives in, the, its smallest linear representation is of dimension almost 200,000. But, uh, um, but you, can, you can approach its uh, understanding it by means of the Leech lattice. Thank you again.